So as we start planning for our final lab practical, lab practical three, we enter a group of experiments known as the selective and differential tests or selective and differential media. And so just like in the previous labs, it requires pre-labs for these. So let's kind of discuss first what's gonna go into the exam. So this exam, this practicum is concerned specifically with technique. And so what, is, uh, what we're looking for in this case is what is actually happening in this type of experiment or assay? How does it happen and why does it happen? And we're uh, specifically interested in the types of results that it produces. So when we start working with our pre-labs for the first group of them, 19 through 27, and the same thing will happen through 28 through 38, is that we're modifying our pre-lab just a tiny little bit. During the objectives, we'll continue to explain what is the assay doing, what is it testing for, what is it working for, as a way to explain it as a purpose. The materials and methods will remain the same on how do you actually perform it. And then the final portion, the original purpose of the pre-lab becomes a results section. What type of outcomes, what type of results are produced from this particular assay? So that's the plan. So let's see if we can explain a little bit further. Remember that the content of every pre-lab is supposed to be an objective methods and purpose, right? So to search for this material, you're gonna to have to read the labs as usual ahead of time. And you're actually going to find the objective and purpose in the introduction of each lab. The first paragraph, two paragraphs of each lab will actually tell you what you're supposed to be doing. It tells you right there, what are you testing? What are you assaying? What are you looking for? What is it trying to learn from this? And what does the actual test accomplish? You'll find it within the first paragraph or two. That's your first job. As you proceed after the little division, you'll find the methods or materials section that you have in there, right? And in there, just like before, this doesn't change. I need you to be able to list to me what are the key material that are involved in this, in, in this event, as well as the key steps. In other words, I'm not looking for you to tell me that you're looking for a bucket of water. I'm not looking for you to tell me that you're you know, cooking this thing for you know, 35 minutes. I'm not looking for you to tell me that it needs media or a plate or a tube, none of that. I'm looking for the key steps and key materials or ingredients, sometimes added before or after, that are part of this step. So only the main important stuff that makes this test different. And then typically, right after the method section on the same piece of paper on the same page or sometimes the next page, then you'll uh, be told what type of results to expect. That's what's going into that uh, original purpose section. So what are the options? What are the possible outcomes of that particular test? Now, most of the time they're fairly dichotomous, meaning that you'll get yeses or nos or positives and negatives. But sometimes you have some alternatives. Sometimes you'll get things like uh, color changes Sometimes you'll get survival basis. So some things die, some things live. And then sometimes you'll see some uh, state changes, anything from color to temperature to even um, something going liquid, something going solid, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually see these at the, end of, uh, at the end of each test. Now, as an example, I want to show you one of the ones we do have in our labs. Mind you, this is my version. Everybody's lab uh, pre-lab will look actually different because it's all about paraphrasing. But let's just focus on lab 32 briefly, which is the malinate test. And so again, if you were to look for that page, you'd find out that right at the very first paragraph, you find the purpose. And it tells you right there that you're searching for organisms that can use malinate as food. In other words, can they use malinate as a carbon source? Can they extract energy from that particular sugar known as malinate? But then as you proceed to read a little bit further, you actually get to find out the true objective behind this. You get to differentiate between certain types of enteric bacteria that are the alkaligenes group versus the acinetobacter group, or also the Klebsiella species away from the serratia and E. coli species. And so what it does is this particular test can differentiate between the ones on the left versus the ones on the right. And it does it by consuming malinate. So now you get to explain to me well, what are the methods? Well, it's actually quite simple for this test. This particular test uses a medium, a key medium, a key ingredient known as malinate broth. And the way that that malinate broth works is by using a very specific indicator known as bromothymol blue. Please do not confuse it with bromothymol blue, which is another version of it. So here, bromothymol blue is the key reactant, the one that needs to be present inside the malinate broth 
that allows us to obtain the results. Now, the other key step that is involved behind this is that you need to grow this guy at human temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, or your 98.6 or 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit for about 24 to 48 hours. So those are all the key things that you need to do. You need the medium with the indicator and the steps involved for you to observe the results. So that's it, that's all that goes into your methods. And then lastly, the results. What are the possible outcomes? Well, like I said, some of them are dichotomous, so you can obtain yeses or nos. In this case, the melanate test, what it does is it gives a positive result when it turns blue. So if your substance, if your broth, if your medium turns blue, basically it's confirming to you that this organism is able to use melanate as food. It's able to use it as a carbon source. It's able to process that sugar. In the negative scenario, the actual substance doesn't change. It actually remains green. That substance, the tube that has the melanate broth starts off green in the first place. And so if there is no change, this concern confirms the negative side. In other words, that it's unable to use melanate. It's unable to use this sugar as a source of food. But there is a third option in this case that pops up every now and then. Sometimes the substance will actually turn yellow. The medium, the tube, will turn a little yellow, which also indicates that no, it didn't use that melanate in there because it would have turned blue, but it can use the other sugar present inside that fluid, which in this case happens to be glucose. And so what happens when it processes it, it ferments it, it acidifies the environment, and it actually turns a little yellow. So your job is to be able to list all three possible outcomes. So this more or less is the entire breakdown of their pre-lab. Your purpose, your materials and methods, and the types of results. Now, how does this translate into an exam? So I want to give you some actual examples that we've used in previous exams as a way to kind of edify you. So when we had our stations, you would actually see certain tubes of the medium, for example, in this case, also part of the melanate test, right? We wouldn't tell you what it is, but you'd be able to identify it on your own. And we would have a question on that uh, station saying, hey, this organism, can it use melanate as a carbon source, right? Now, the one that I have over there is the one that is in question, the one that I circled, the one that says Klebsiella pneumoniae, right? And so your job would be to identify, does it use melanate or not? The answer here would be yes, because it's blue, right? The medium usually starts off as green. And if it turns blue, that's the positive confirmation. If it turns yellow, it's also negative, but it ends up using glucose. And if it remains greenish, it means nothing happened. So in this case, by looking at the results and comparing the color, you'd be able to say, well, yes, this one, this organism can use melanate as a carbon source. Now let's take this just a little bit further, right? Same station, same uh, setup, but now let's ask a different question, right? We could ask you, well, out of these tubes, how do we know that one is different than the other? What allows us to tell these colors apart? And as you know, part of the materials and methods section of your pre-lab will be asking, well, what's the key reactant, the key reagent, or the one ingredient that allows us to tell it apart? Well, in this case, it's the indicator, which is known as bromthymol blue, the portion that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Now, to kind of close this off, let me give you a couple of slightly different variations behind these guys. Slightly different version. This is a, a VP test that you're seeing on the left-hand side. It stands for Vogue's Proskoyer. Um, in this case, this test, you get to find out what it does, how it does it. That'll be part of your pre-lab understanding. But what I'm showing you here is the result. And it's asking you, hey, what does this result mean? Now, you guys don't have the background yet. You'll have to look this up. But as you can see from the color, it looks this kind of yellowish orange. Now, once you read the lab, you get to find out that when it remains yellow or orange, that it's the negative result. And you'd find out conclusively that this particular organism uh, does not use this medium that does not consume glucose without acidifying it, and so it doesn't really change. So you call it a negative result. In reality, you get to find that in order for you to get a positive result, it actually turns red. So when you add the correct reagents, the substance turns red rather than remaining yellow. Small little variation behind this, in this case, is another test known as the Indole test, part of the IMVIC series also, and which asks you the same thing, saying, hey, well, what does this result mean? Your job would be to basically say, hey, this is positive or this is negative. And you get to find out that for this particular test, if the medium remains the same color, it's negative. If it turns anywhere between pinkish to red, it's the positive. 
And so here you'll be able to confirm that the organism in question, which happens to be E. coli, can actually use the uh, amino acid tryptophan as food. So when it does that, as it processes it, it re uh, releases certain uh, products. It causes the medium to change color when we add some reagents. So that's what you do. So this is what we're trying to aim for, to be able to understand what the test does, how is the test doing it, and what type of results to expect. And that's what you're going to be including in your pre-lab. And so that pre-lab is now functioning as your way to study for your lab practical number three. Now, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to remind everybody that you already have this information as well. Not only do all of these tests from 19 through 38 have been already posted on YouTube, you should be able to see them now, right? As a way to, for you to prepare, it'll show you pictures uh, and videos of the actual results and the tests before and after, that way you know what's going on. But this is also appearing in your uh, lab supplement. So you can actually read them there. All of those 20 labs are there listed with the results and what's going on. But just in case to make sure that no questions appear later on to make sure that we give you all the information you need, we also have a document that appears on Canvas ready for you that this gives you a little bit more of a tips and tricks version. So that way you can see kind of what we expect out of you. So the document that you're seeing here is an example write up too. So not only do we have the transformation of the pre-lab there, you have it color coded kind of going through other examples, but then right after it kind of gives you a walkthrough of what one of these tests will actually be and where we're going and what we're trying to learn. So what's great about this is that we have three sources. Not only you have this document, which gives you some ideas on how to write the pre-lab, but also you have the sources of information on YouTube as well as the lab supplement. Putting all these together, you should be able to have about 48 hours to be able to complete your pre-labs to submit them prior to your exams.